so then Tsahi um, comes on the scene um, and he was uh, an EMBO fellow in the group and then an EMBO advanced fellow, the first EMBO advanced fellow. Uh, he, he, he loved uh, Cambridge, he loved EMBO fellowships and he loves host virus interactions. So we look forward to your talk, talk Tsahi and um, how you're doing in, in Tel Aviv with your own group now. Thank you, Sarah. Can you see? I cannot. Yeah, yeah. Get this full to it's all working. Screen, but I guess that would be good enough for us. Okay. So uh, thank you very much Sarah, for organizing this, and and um, it uh, all makes us, I think, uh, a little bit nostalgic, and I feel a bit old. Um, as Sarah uh, was saying, um, I work on um, host virus uh, coevolution. And just to put um, myself in the settings of the Thai club, uh, I arrived a, a bit after uh, she and before JP. And I also overlapped with uh, Ola and we shared the mutual interest in uh, puffins. And uh, today I'm going to talk with you about a project uh, that is somewhat different than what uh, I was uh, doing with uh, Sarah. We were working on uh, the evolution of the immune system using a uh, single cell and other genomics techniques. But today I'm going to talk with you about uh, another aspect of host virus interaction. And that is the evolutionary paradox of, of these interactions. And this will be using a structural bioinformatics technique. So I'm hoping that both the immunologists and the, 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 the genomicists and the structural people will be interested, or maybe nobody will understand what I'm trying to say here. So um, if you put it in presenter mode, then, then, we, then we don't see the little slides on the left. How do we get to the Up to you. mode? Up to you. Just on the bottom, yeah, or on the bottom right. Yeah. Yeah, on the little the little screen icon. Further down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can leave the meeting. This is what I. <laughs> Never mind. I will need to get next back. to the minus sign, but it's okay. It's okay. Never mind. Anyway, uh, so um, the. Uh, Interactions between uh, uh, viral proteins and host proteins are renowned to evolve uh, very rapidly. And this is because these proteins are in a genetic conflict. Uh, in every case, one of the members of these interactions does not, does not want to interact with its partner, unlike uh, regular uh, proteins with, uh, in, within our body. For example, here we have, we have a viral protein that uh, tries to interact with a host protein, so the viral protein in blue, the host protein in, in red. And uh, because uh, the, the red host protein does not want to interact with the, vi with the virus, it can uh, uh, evolve, it can uh, uh, mutate away from this interaction and the interaction is abolished. However, uh, the virus in turn can also evolve and create another uh, a set of mutations and then he will get the, the, the interaction will be uh, regained. And so we get this evolutionary arms race where both sides keep evolving against each other. And we often uh, uh, mention that uh, these interactions have signature of positive selection, meaning they evolve very rapidly in coding sequence, unlike uh, usual interfaces. However, and here comes the paradox, um, Many reports, including our own uh, uh, nature, uh, reported that, in fact, uh, uh, many uh, uh, human proteins that are uh, interacting with uh, viruses are significantly conserved. And this seems to be in a complete contrast with, with what is known in, with the rest of the literature about the signatures of positive selection and the rapid evolution of host viral, virus protein-protein interaction. And so uh, uh, I, uh, we were wondering uh, uh, how can we reconcile these seemingly contrasting uh, uh, or contradictory results? And uh, we hypothesized that um, these, these, these contrasting trends uh, may be a product of different type, mixture of different types of interactions, both in terms of functions of the proteins involved and the biophysical nature 
of, of these interactions and, and, and to look at it more carefully, we took a divide and conquer approach and we decided to focus on one particular type of a host virus protein protein interactions and, and we wanted to contrast it with uh, all the other uh, protein protein interactions that uh, are known. And uh, if we think about human proteins, uh, they're usually composed of several uh, domains. There are multi-domain proteins as uh, Sarah showed many, 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 many years ago. And uh, um, uh, the way these uh, human proteins interact with each other, uh, we can uh, segregate them in a very crude way into two different uh, uh, mechanisms. They can either form domain-domain interactions with one of their domains with another domain from another protein, or they can uh, more sophisticatedly interact with a small motif in the other uh, protein forming a domain motif interaction. And, and, and these motifs also called ELMs are basically very short uh, uh, peptides with some regular expression, some uh, uh, motif, very simple, two, three, four, six amino acids. And they are short uh, and simple to evolve and, and they usually are involved in a regulatory in interactions. And for the sake of this presentation and for this work, we will name the, the domains that bind these motifs EBDs, which is just our invention. It's not a, a, a proper a term in the field. And if you think about it, a, a viruses can really utilize these a, a, a motifs. Uh, think about it for a moment, and then I will explain in a, moment, in a minute why. So viral proteins, when they interact, when they want to interact, want to interact with our proteins, they can either a, a, a interact with other domains through domain-domain interactions or by mimicking these small motifs that I just mentioned. And this is basically a motif mimicry. And when you think about it, it, it can be very beneficial for the virus because it is easy to evolve. It is short, it is simple, it doesn't take a lot of space. And there you, you basically have an interaction module that is already ready. Like it has a, a binding pocket in, in several uh, domains in, in various uh, uh, human proteins. So this is very beneficial for the virus to evolve. And indeed we and others have uh, uh, looked into this um, uh, we had a work many years ago with uh, Madan, who is going to talk later today, and we showed that uh, uh, this mimicry might of, of motifs by viral proteins might be the most uh, common way viral, viral viruses mimic our uh, uh, protein protein interactions. And, and so, uh, uh, to look into these uh, 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 domain motif uh, interactions, we uh, split the human proteome into those uh, proteins that have. EBD, so they are not composed of only EBD, that's only one domain that can bind motif, but they have multiple domains. But if, if, if you have at least one EBD, you will be here, and all the rest are here. And then within these uh, uh, two sets of EBD containing and non EBD containing human proteins, we can further uh, divide them into those that have a, a viral uh, interaction, viral protein interactions. Uh, and, and then what, what, what we did next is to look at the conservation of these human proteins across the vertebrate clade uh, using um, uh, orthologous sequences and uh, some evolutionary uh, uh, models. And you can see here that by and large, the uh, EBD uh, proteins, they are the brighter boxes are more conserved than the non-EBD proteins. And the, whenever a viral protein interacts with a, a human protein, the, the human protein uh, uh, is more conserved uh, uh, on average than its uh, uh, um, respective uh, protein class that do not interact with viruses. And most importantly, the proteins that have EBD and interact with viruses are the most conserved across all these groups that we studied. So uh, 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 these viral uh, uh, motifs target basically highly conserved human proteins. Now, uh, uh, um, we can take these uh, human proteins that have EBDs in them and split them into the region of the EBD domain versus the non-EBD domain. And you can see that the EBDs are even more conserved within the protein that they are contained in. So, so viruses are even clever, not only that they target conserved proteins, they also target the more conserved region within this uh, uh, protein. We can take it 
one uh, step further and also segregate the EBD, the domain itself into its core surface and interface. Interface is the region where the motif either of the host or the mimicked viral motif is interacting with the domain. And you can see here that in all these cases, surface core and especially interface, when a viral motif is involved in, in, in interacting with this uh, EBD, it is more conserved. And we did one final uh, exercise here. We looked at those EBDs where we know that more than one virus is interacting uh, with the EBDs and they're even more conserved. So to summarize this story, this class of interactions where viruses mimic a, a motifs is a very sophisticated strategy by the viruses to target very well conserved regions and even very constrained pockets of bindings uh, within these regions of uh, human proteins. And this is probably beneficial for the viruses and our proteins are stuck. They cannot evolve away at all from these interactions because they are using these uh, uh, binding pockets to, to interact with numerous uh, uh, human uh, uh, proteins in the same manner. And so now comes the paradox that I mentioned uh, to begin with, where are those uh, rapidly evolving host virus protein protein interactions that I mentioned uh, uh, to begin with. So uh, uh, to answer this, we looked at a data set of a, a, a human proteins with no signatures of positive selection. So positive selection without getting into the details here a, a, a means that we have a protein with a dramatic or drastic a, a evolution and of substitution of, of, the, of the amino acids between closely related a, a, a species. And we don't have that many of these proteins in our a, a, a body. And, but, but you can see that even within these a, a few a, a, a human proteins, the EBDs, and especially those that bind viruses, are depleted of this positive selection. So basically, a, a proteins that have EBD or bind viruses with EBD, they are almost completely devoid of these signatures of positive selection. However, many a, a proteins with, or not many, a, 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 a proteins that bind viruses, but not through these EBDs, are somewhat enriched with positive a, a, a selection signatures. And a, when we're looking deeper into it, I will again not a, go into the details, we see that those viral binding proteins with uh, signatures of positive selection have unique characteristics, both in terms of function, they are clearly enriched with functions of direct inhibition of viruses. So many of these proteins are specialist proteins that target viruses. We call them host restriction factors because they restrict the viruses. They have specific antiviral activities or and or actually they have unique biophysical characteristics. They either interact with very few uh, human proteins and their, the residues that evolve very rapidly are also loose residues, meaning they don't form many interactions within the body of their protein. So they're basically more evolvable, both in terms of intercontact with other uh, human proteins and, and intracontacts within the protein fold that they uh, reside at. So to summarize, a, a, what I showed you, and this is the proposed a, model that we have. So when a, viruses a, a, tries to a, a, a infect a cell and successfully replicate in it, it forms two major types of interactions. Interactions that are of the unwanted a, a, a manner, where we have these antiviral restriction factors that directly engage with it, and they're specialized in this type of interactions. These interactions, can evolve very rapidly because there are no boundaries, there are no constraints to the host proteins. It does not need to, 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 to think of other functions or to be constrained by many other interactions with other human proteins. The other class, the other important class of proteins that viruses interact with are called host factors. Those are the uh, uh, factors, the human proteins that are needed for the viral interaction. So the, the virus actually wants to interact with these a, 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 a proteins, a, and some of them you know, for example, in, in the corona, a, 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 the, 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 the SARS-CoV-2, the receptor and the protease, which became very famous, they, are, they belong to this class of host factors. 
And uh, when a virus engages with this type of, of host factor, there are basically two different uh, 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 scenarios. These host factors can either be very constrained and then sadly for them, they cannot move away from these interactions that are beneficial for the virus, but are harmful for the host. So they are stuck and the virus can interact with them. And, and the host is basically at least coding sequence wise, it is stuck and cannot escape. However, there is another class of proteins of host factors that are more evolvable, those that don't have many uh, uh, interactions in them. And they then they can escape these interactions. And this is why we often see an enrichment when we look globally at the interactions that viruses form with human proteins. We often see that they are uh, often more conserved than the rest of the human protein, specifically because of this, because we cannot avoid and evolve away from these interactions. But in the case of the evolvable interactions, we can escape from uh, them. And I hope I uh, did not com completely confuse you. Uh, I would just like to thank uh, uh, the person who did all this work. This is Gal from my lab, and these are the other uh, members of, uh, of my lab. And uh, most of them have uh, German, German names, but uh, we only have one uh, real German. And thank you all for listening. Really nice talk. And, um, you know, thank you for bringing innate immunity to my lab, uh, Zahi. You know, it's, it's, uh, it became a major theme as alongside the adaptive immunity. Um, so that was really fantastic. And I wonder whether you talk to Emmanuel at all in Israel, because you're, you're, you come from different eras of the lab. So you probably don't know each other, but you might have some positive interactions that could evolve. Uh, well, you, Emmanuel and I know each other, but I think uh, uh, thanks to the Corona, I I haven't been to the Weizmann. I actually haven't been out of Tel Aviv <laughs> for most of the last two years. I have. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, it's not the best today. time. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, we have a little bit of wiggle room because Sarah Kummerfeld may not be able to give her talk because her son is ill. Um, so, is there any question for Tsahi? Yeah, um, can you, can uh, Anna Maria, could you, uh, she'll bring the, the microphone to you. Yeah. <laughs> so that the online people can, can hear as well. And yeah, online people, if you put up your hand, then I can see if you have a question. And Joe Marsh, if, if you could think about, if you're able to, to shift up and give your talk after Jose, that just send me a message if that's okay with you. So I was curious about the cons the evolvable protein, the evolvable host proteins, and I, because I always thought that viruses evolve much like faster than humans, so there's no such class in humans. So we're just like stuck with the constrained one. What are like examples of these evolvable proteins that like, and which virus do they did they escape? <laughs> So um, many of these yep. uh, proteins are antiviral proteins, classical antiviral proteins like uh, tetherin and uh, viprin, and, and, and these engage specifically with uh, 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 viruses. And indeed, you know, the, their evolutionary rate is not as uh, fast as, as, as the viruses, but it's, it's more of a conflict where you need to think about it uh, uh, from a point of view of a very, a big and highly regulated army against, you know, very few uh, guerrilla warriors, basically, that are much more free to, to make up their own uh, strategy. But then they're also surrounded by many types of soldiers and sentinels. So when you use your uh, uh, better mutational power to evolve against or away from one human protein, you will usually bump into another uh, defense mechanism. This is actually another uh, uh, um, great, uh, great question and great puzzle uh, in, 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 uh, in the evolution of the immune system and why are we even surviving this evolutionary arms race. It's basically our big army, which is slowly evolving, 
uh, with respect to these very few uh, viral proteins that are rapidly evolving. The, the, the arms race is not symmetrical. Thank you, that's super interesting. Great, thank you, uh, Tzachary, that was amazing.